Suez Canal University, Ismailia, Egypt, 2013. University student Sharif Jaber attends a science lecture in which his professor insists that LGBT people should be crucified in the middle of the streets. Sharif challenges his professor publicly, saying that science has shown homosexuality to be genetic and unchangeable, and that the professor should stick to science. Criticism and threats against Sharif begin immediately. A professor prints many of Sharif's Facebook posts promoting secular values and purposely circulates them throughout the university as a public attack on Sharif. The professor even goes as far as to say that if they were in a different Islamic country, he would have killed him. Six months later, Sharif is safe in his home when in the dead of night, armored vehicles surround his house, police officers carry out a raid, and Sharif is dragged from his home and arrested. He spends time in jail while his case is investigated. His computer, phone, books, and money are all confiscated. After some deliberation, the court charges him with the crimes of inciting atheism and immoral values, contempt for religions, dissemination of indecent ideas, and dissemination of malicious and controversial thoughts. His bail is set at 7,500 Egyptian pounds, which equals about 425 US dollars. He can't pay and his family refuses to help, so he spends 40 days in jail. Finally, the Association for Freedom of Thought and Expression, an Egyptian human rights organization, posts his bail and he's freed. The court, however, doesn't close his case, keeping it open to the possibility of further charges. Once out of jail, Sharif contacts his university. Up until this point, Sharif has been a model student with some of the highest test scores in his part of Egypt. He's at the top of his class. However, in light of the controversy, his professors unanimously decide to fail him in every class in order to purposely ruin his future career. A year later, in February 2015, Sharif's case is reviewed again, and he's sentenced to one year in prison along with hard labor. Before he's taken into custody, Sharif somehow manages to flee and goes on the run from the law. He begins preparing to leave Egypt for good, knowing that he'll be found out and arrested eventually. But something stops him. It isn't another squadron of police officers. It's himself. He doesn't want religious fanatics to win. He doesn't want to walk away from a society that needs a dissenting voice like his. On his eventual decision to stay, he writes, My goal is to be able to express myself any way I want, and to help those who desire the same freedom to be able to do so as well in our own country. I could do it from anywhere else in the world, but I believe it would have a more powerful effect to do it here, where we're born and raised. For me, it was never about seeking a better life for myself, but making others feel safe here. I found that me staying here gives others courage to come out and a little bit of safety. That's the main reason I always preferred not to leave, no matter how hard it gets. Sharif decides to stay in Egypt and speak out even louder. I chose to stay, and instead of defending gay rights in front of my class, I wanted to do it in front of millions by making YouTube videos, and I did. I collected all the money I have and bought a camera and other studio equipment. After my first video, which was about homosexuality, I lost almost all of my relatives, including my mother and siblings. No one wanted to talk to me, but I kept going. I changed my place, lived alone, and started making videos about other controversial topics in the Arab world, topics very few dared to discuss while living in Egypt. And with every couple of videos, I had to change where I live because I fear that someone in this place might have recognized me. Sharif successfully evades the law for three years and gains massive popularity on YouTube, gaining over 152,000 subscribers and over 9 million views as of this video's release. But as he expected from the start, the law begins to catch up to him. In March 2018, the religious conservative al Noor party files a blasphemy claim against Sharif, accusing him of assaulting the Islamic religion and Sharia, disturbing the public peace, provoking strife among society, denying the definite truth of Islam, and criticizing the Prophet Muhammad. Sharif turns to his blog and writes the following. Now since I heard the news about the new charges, I feel lost. It's been 10 days already, and I don't know what my next step should be. The blasphemy charges can put me behind bars for five years easily, but it won't stop at that. I've read comments from Muslim lawyers on my Facebook account stating that they will add more years, up to 15 years, to my sentence by filing other complaints and charges from other videos of mine after I get arrested. Since I heard the news, I changed where I live again, and then thought about whether it's the time to leave this place or not. I don't like the feeling of running away, I don't like when I see fanaticism wins, and I don't like leaving Egypt knowing there's hundreds of thousands here who are silenced because they fear some fanatics like Saad. 
but eventually, it's too much, even for Sharif. He decides to flee Egypt to Malaysia. He gathers his things, leaves his home for presumably the last time, and heads to the airport to fly to Cairo. He encounters a frightening snag at security. An agent stops him, asking if he knows there's a warrant out for his arrest. Sharif denies everything, saying he's flown inside Egypt before without any trouble. The agent frees Sharif after some questioning, and Sharif flies to Cairo. Security in the Cairo airport, however, is not as forgiving. He's detained. In the midst of the confusion, Sharif writes on his Patreon, I'm supposed to be traveling to Malaysia on 12.05 Cairo time, an hour from now. The police took me and made me wait in this room for two hours, and I'm still waiting. They took my belongings and my passport, and I don't know what's going on. If I didn't update you in an hour from now, know that I was arrested. I will delete this since they'll search my mobile. I hope that you read this through email. Don't share this message unless two hours. I will update you if they didn't arrest me. Two hours pass. Nothing from Sharif. The International Humanist and Ethical Union and several online media outlets report confirmation of his arrest. Atheist Republic covers the story and spreads a petition calling for Sharif's freedom. On May 7, 2018, three days after his arrest, Sharif breaks his silence and tweets, Four days in hell. I'm free. Okay. In Egypt. Details will follow in the right time, but not soon. Thank you all. Really. I'm happy that Sharif is free, but this is far from the end of the story for him or any other ex-Muslim, especially in the Middle East. The persecution that Sharif suffered is in no way uncommon. Just to name a couple more cases, Karim Ashraf Mohammed Albina was sentenced to three years in prison for insulting Islam by promoting atheism on Facebook in Egypt, and famously, Raif Badawi was sentenced to ten years in prison, a thousand lashes, and a fine for insulting Islam through electronic channels in Saudi Arabia. Persecution is not limited to ex-Muslim activists either. All the time, ex-Muslims in the Middle East express that if they were to come out as ex-Muslims, their own families would either disown them, report them to the government, or even kill them. Even ex-Muslims in the West say that if they were to come out, they'd be committing total social suicide at the very least. This problem is so obviously abhorrent, pervasive, and against the values we all share in the West that it should be easy to communicate in our own circles if not even across party lines, right? No. Ex-Muslim activists have a notoriously hard time getting platforms on either side of the political spectrum. Left-leaning media shies away from them because people often conflate their criticism of Islam with discrimination against Muslims, calling them Islamophobic. Some non-Christian liberals also resort to whataboutery, always insisting Christianity be criticized for the same thing at the same moment as Islam. I just want to mention one bad experience I have with when talking to ex-Christians is this constant need for them to bring up Christianity when we're talking about Islam. <laughs> yes. We know, we agree, Christianity is bullshit, but we are talking about Islam right now. It's like going into a cancer fundraiser and saying, but what about AIDS? <laughs> like, okay, yes, AIDS is bad, but this is a fundraiser about cancer. Finally, right-leaning media often gives ex-Muslims more airtime than the left, so the left often associates ex-Muslims with the right which is ridiculous given that their message is one of opposition to religious conservatism. On the right, though, a lot of people have figured out that their message goes beyond criticizing Islam and is ultimately strong advocacy for political and educational secularism. I mean, most of the people we're talking about here are atheists. They also oppose Christianity in both government and principle. Because of that, much of the right-leaning media denies them a platform, too. The reality of the situation is that ex-Muslim activists like Sharif are nothing short of heroes, championing reason and freedom of thought in the most dangerous situations possible. If we want them to succeed, it's vital we rally together and give them support when no one else will. In my opinion, this is the most important issue worldwide for the atheist community to address. One of the main reasons I strive to build community among atheists is so we can band together to support apostates in need where they are, and then if they choose or are forced to leave their homes, receive them into our thriving community with open arms. Allow me to leave you with this clip of Atheist Republic founder Armin Navabi discussing Sharif Jaber's decision to stay in Egypt. Wherever you're living right now, any rights that you're enjoying today, any sense of security that you have, any sense of peace that you have, is because there were people before you that sacrificed their sense of 
security, their peace, uh, their freedom, and, and their lives for you to enjoy them today. So if somebody knowingly, somebody that knows the risk associated with their activism still goes and takes these risks for the rest of us, the only proper response to this kind of bravery is thank you. Thank you to all the apostates who have sacrificed to protect the rights we all enjoy. And thank you, Sharif. As always, I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. Praise be unto Adam, my top patron and personal lord and savior for making this video possible. Go ahead and check out my Patreon, subscribe to my channel, follow me on Twitter at GM Skeptic, and until next time, stay skeptical.